Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to an episode that is uh, designed to be members only. But the first couple episodes, most likely, will have public live streams and then be made into members only. Anyways, the title for this evening <coughs> is The Man Who Found the Edge of the Sky. And hopefully my voice is loud enough, and if there's audio issues, uh, I hope the audience will let me know. So you see, um, the way I give these episodes is that if there is an observation that is important enough to share, uh, I will dedicate an episode to. And there has been this idea of trying to find the edge of the sky. We as human beings... <coughs> Excuse me, just a second. Okay, this is better. So we as human beings look at this world and do a reality check. That means we wonder about what is real and where we are. We notice that we are found on a rock in the middle of nowhere and the sky is endless. What we call the sky is actually how a sphere is an empty space. <clears throat> that means any object you, any giant celestial object you, uh, you stand on, it has a sky, you can say. People have been looking for the edge of the sky, and when I thought about this, it was very funny to me, because I noticed that there is two edges. There is one edge of, a, of the sky, which is the edge of the universal sector. It goes that far where we don't even know where it leads. We categorize it as a universe, but this is just our naming process from where we are. A lot of things are arbitrary and we, we keep it as real. What's even a more fascinating observation is that the human being has to manifest itself. It has to keep its attention on the type of self it wants to be in some sense, to even be a self. So the whole meaning of reality arises out of our attention to it. Now when we pay attention to the edge of the universe, we cannot see it, but what is the other edge? And so th this was inspired, this idea was inspired out of Cyclops from the X-Men. <laughs> <clears throat> that I looked at Cyclops and I realized he's the only fictitious character where light uh, actually leaves his eyes, you know, like a light beam leaves his eyes. And if you, if you fathom that Cyclops was like in outer space, or maybe not in outer space, because then <clears throat> it would be a breathing hazard, but if, if light could project from your eyes and it could go straight, it could go straight towards the edge of the universe, one edge would be the edge of the universe the other edge would be your eyes would be your mind so the mind is the edge of the sky <clears throat> that's the whole point of this episode you know where i found this was a fascinating observation that where is the sky found where is the world found what is found in our attention This beautiful artwork I found uh, on this website called Wallhaven, <coughs> uh, it had the image of the phoenix. And the image of the phoenix is found in different mythologies. It is found in Persian mythology, uh, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, Jewish mythology. <clears throat> and for me, this sign of immortality, this sign of uh, something reaching, uh, oh my god, laptop has low battery. Uh, quick intermission, folks.
continue. <coughs> The phoenix represents a symbol of immortality. It is the idea of this flaming, uh, this uh, burning uh, bird that is immortal. I read something that in the ancient Egyptian times they would go find the egg of a phoenix because they believed that in some sense it would bring immortality. So the phoenix is this universal metaphor of endless recontinuation, <clears throat> endless uh, beginnings. It is, it is a bird that is reincarnating to itself. And when we look at the world, when human beings emerge, their attention actually generates a new view, a new scope on the world. That means we either have one sky or we have eight billion plus different skies you know so it is in some sense the access to the reality is like the beginning of the edge of the sky there is something about uh, things beginning and things ending which is a very uh, giant clue uh, about the existential situation we're in I know that uh, I will one day die. I know that uh, after I have died, many human beings will be born. And so if I identify with the notion of humanity, with the human experience, it's as if the human humanity, our species, this genetical uh, desire uh, for survival and continuity this is in some sense a species being like a phoenix. You know, there has been even ideas that there has been extinctions, but um, the level of the extinction event was in some sense where only bacteria survived. And then that bacteria again stood up, stood up. It's as if phenomenology uh, wants to rise, you know, and the reason for this is the sun. You know, sometimes I wonder if there was no sun, there would be no life, there would be nothing to even see. And how crucial light is <clears throat> to our meaning. That means one can even say that if the mind is perceiving the sky and the mind requires light, just light, the presence of light is also the edge of the sky. So anybody who realizes that their access to the realm is the beginning of their meaning and one has the concept of the sky, that concludes the man who found the edge of the sky. <clears throat> that means the edge is where the beginning is and also its ending. You know, in, in this episode right now, I feel like diving a bit deeper into the mystical yogic angle of the realm. You see, every human being harbors within themselves some pathway of sight, some sort of journey. That means there is one angle where we identify or try to compare um, <clears throat> and um, measure in accordance like uh, the value of the human being in accordance to an absolutist image all right human beings need to be this or we can be, uh, perceive human beings as dynamic states of being that means we are our species currently is under the impression that we are people i find that in the future it will go towards realizing that we are actually movements we are life force we are a force of life just moving you know something that out of this whole inanimate uh, system has began to move you know? <clears throat> and when I say inanimate I mean our movements our reality like the concept of reality is for the creature alone that means if in the future extraterrestrials landed on earth and we're like hey the extraterrestrials do you believe in angels you know and the extraterrestrials might look at us and be like you know to each their own. Every person's eyes opens up the meaning of the world differently. I can't tell you even how many people I know personally who I have conver uh, conversed with uh, about the deep nature of reality in which for them <clears throat> reality is just a station. It's as if like you're at a certain subway station 
and then there's other levels to the station you know the idea of reality being like a prison reality being like a school <clears throat> you know both of them are terrifying <laughs> <laughs> you know when we realize uh, humans existed before time but the concept of human didn't my observation of this realm is that it is a giant event and we as creatures, due to our uh, difference between other animals, our ability to be conscious, this, our sophisticated ability to use language, we in some sense uh, transcend the... Uh, it's as if uh, we are actually characters in a film, but we are living in a world like a photograph. It's just such a strange uh, existence. And what is normal is always updating. And ultimately, and this may be my flaw, you see every person is like a telescope that sees a certain uh, <coughs> uh, amount of the world. As far as I've seen, I see no greater purpose to reality then uh, in some sense the simultaneous response to how in the outer realms it is actually the game of continuity uh, the game of trying to continue a certain quality of an objective experience and in the inner realms it is in some sense to advance the communication of the species That means our physical purpose is to pretty much leave our mark on everything. Our non-physical or inner purpose is to realize who's leaving the mark. There was something shared about <clears throat> the idea of the phoenix in mythology that it was such a giant bird it could lift up elephants. And that shows the size of uh, how wild the inner realms were. When we look at the past to wonder about how much they considered the difference between a, a world where you are instantaneously where you instantaneously have free will in to move things and a world where that the world moves first then your free will uh, uh, aligns to it <clears throat> i don't know how well i said that but <laughs> You know, this uh, phoenix metaphor can actually very smoothly connect to uh, what is experiencing movement uh, in the outer realms and what is experiencing or aware of stillness in the inner realms. Every day that we go to sleep and we wake up, what is taking place is that the phoenix, the ideological phoenix, is being reborn. Consciousness is entering 
and exiting the arena of reality as if we're logging into <clears throat> physical life and then uh, into physical into objective and subjective life and then when we go into deep sleep there is no ego identity or anything It's as if human beings, when thinking about what is going on in the world, have fathomed everything except the impossible, which is nothing is being nothing consciously. image it is a cycle it is uh, like an airplane that is going through different elevations of realism I think about who I was yesterday like literally who I, how I was yesterday and I think about how I will be tomorrow and I notice that all thought is like a momentary event that from a simple moment of existing my experience identifies. This classification between the inner realm and outer realm, uh, for those who may be new, I call it Mr. Within's inner realm and outer realmism. Inner and outer realmism. And the reason is, is because most people don't consider the inner realms. From a young age, we are taught that, you know, imagination is not real. We are told that uh, creativity does, uh, has less of a value in a mechanical system, do you know? In a system where you understand the system and it's like, okay, it's going from A to B, from B to C, from C to D. If suddenly a person comes and jumps from A to D, do you know? Or from B to C. <clears throat> Let's say you're from British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so whatever, it, I mean, B to C would be regular. But let's say from B to A or something. It's as if like uh, how we accept movement how we accept the noun suggests the verb it could be. And if we're stuck in a specific noun, anybody on this planet, if you're stuck in a specific noun of identity, all you require to do is to experience a state of mind which is like a verb. Because past suffering is about nouns, you know? People suffer in accordance to their mind being able to have seen another way and not having implemented it. You know, this is ultimately what finds us at the moment of passing, and at the moment of transitioning in this realm. From meaning, we pilot to the absence of meaning. And the greatest skill, I would say honestly, the greatest skill, this is, this is how I would say uh, some beings are old souls compared to young souls, that the being can witness the witness and it's an instantaneous contentment I have scrolled around you don't know the way I, I looked at ancient texts of this world was as if like it was hidden treasure or like spacecraft debris and I wanted to figure out what it is then I realized that all the ancient wisdom traditions are pointing to an experience and an experience is in, has something to do with movement direct movement you know something hilarious <laughs> even though in uh, ancient uh, traditions you know they frowned upon promiscuity you know and <clears throat> adultery you know but enlightenment's metaphor is exactly like sex <laughs> where in some sense the experience is different than the idea. 
you know and how many events how many how many things in this life that the experience is completely different than the idea sometimes you see people in life who are bold and I'll tell you this like uh, my grandfather this religious uh, <laughs> this religious 80 year old man you know I have seen demonstrations of self-confidence from this man that have been unbelievable you know? <laughs> you know and his mentality was that because the future is unknown and the system is a dynamic system one cannot let themselves be taken by their judgment of something before it happens so in some sense, he was like a bulldozer personality simply because until it happened, he did not uh, reject. He was, he was, his advancement was experience oriented, you know. <clears throat> and so this distinction between the experience of something have, uh, being totally different than the idea of something, you know, it, it's like the ultimate reality check where you suddenly notice how, what percentage of your life you have been living as a subject. That means you've looked at the moment and it's been subjectively true. And how much you've been looking at the moment and it's objectively true, you know? And even though we have this uh, modern community, like in the New Age community, there's this whole thing about the law of attraction, you know, how the mind, in some sense, there's a subconscious component to it, meaning that your mind is like a machine. And then what you think is your personality is uh, a, a sort of summary of this machine. But in some sense, the mind doesn't care about personality. That means, I'll give you an example. Uh, imagine you're a person who your way of connecting with people is through sharing your misery and misfortune. <laughs> <clears throat> I've met people who they bond with others by sharing how uh, miserable they are, you know, or how uh, how life is not adequate, you know. <clears throat> uh, so people who share, in some sense, their misery, they in some sense have not realized that they are actually programming a personality-less machine. And that is the whole point of the subconscious. That means if there's... Uh, um, a person, let's say you're a person, I'll give you an example. Let's say you, with a very intense tone, you go and say to someone, I like you, but it's like a shout. It's like a Japanese, like, you know, warlord shout. Yeah. <laughs> that means it's intense. The way it's said, the way the personality shared it was intense, but all that the subconscious hears is, I like you. Do you see what I mean? That means the, the, the subjective storyline doesn't really, uh, the subconscious doesn't care for it. So those people who say, I'm successful, I'm successful, they're literally like pro-typing into their subconscious, you know? They're instructing a machine, you know? This is the cool thing about life, that the more natural we were, the more silent life was. The more unnatural we became, the louder, the more chaotic, not chaotic, but consciously chaotic life became, do you know? Because we know that in order for life to have come to this sophistication of evolutionary advancement so far biologi biologically, it had to have a moment where it all the odds were against it and the universe just opened the door, do you know? and so granted by the universal sector for a, a, a biological movement to notice it. It's phenomenal when you really uh, look at reality. Like sometimes I feel that the concept of failure cannot exist because we have successfully continued for 4.5 billion years so far. You know, that is, that is like, you know, people should write that on their resume. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> what is your background? <laughs> You know, genetical continuity uh, in an unfa unfa with unfathomable intensity. You know, like that's really how we're all here. By the way, <coughs> uh, just a quick note, uh, something I've written in the comment section. Um, uh, because this membership option is a new thing, uh, these episodes, in some sense, uh, for, like some of the live streams, maybe like 20 of them will be shared live, and then it will just become shared live for members only. 
you know so for those interested just you know check out the information of the channel like the description or whatever <laughs> <coughs> or the project update video but anyways <sighs> there's so many ways the world can be interpreted and it's designed so that it's interpreted by many that's the cool thing of life if we were all the same it would be a weird world of like clones you know and so this means diversity not only has to be welcomed but it is the most important idea you know that in it's as if every nation of the world every part of this planet has in some sense developed human beings that see something that the other parts of the planet don't and really what it is it's like we are all like these information centers that have not decided to connect you know sometimes i look at the scientific mentality and science is an incredible technique it's an incredible method mainly because it starts with uh as ayn rand this this woman in her philosophy she said it as an absolute objective reality that means it's as if from the scientific angle we look at what is here but the most uh, bizarre thing about trying to uh, uh, make yourself certain that reality is here is that ultimately it will be subjective overlay so really the what what where we are is and so we have began you know becoming speakers <laughs> you know it's like the volume knob of the uh, uh, evolutionary apes consciousness was raised you know <laughs> what can be said the edge of the sky is in our eyes all that we consider is an object is only made available like the certainty that you know reality is being reality is subjective it's codependent it's like a coin it's like our eyes have opened uh one eye on the other one side of the coin and another eye on the other side of a coin imagine like a giant coin was a portal and you, your left shoulder went into the portal first and you stopped that at the middle where the portal was between your forehead you know it's as if one foot in in another dimension the other foot in another dimension our bodies are in silent emptiness they're found in that sort of context and our minds are actually found in this infinite noise so what it is it's it's like the neighbors are having a party and the, we can hear the music of the party and non-existence is like slowly lifting from its you know uh chair of emptiness <laughs> say the sky is an infinite subject and man's relationship with an infinite subject inevitably will make him consider that he is infinite too in previous talks i had categorized the realm uh, through four dimensions i called it zero one two infinity these four symbols that means anybody who wants symbols you can pretty much understand the events of this realm <coughs> when I say zero I mean space that means you as a human being upon entrance into this uh, workspace this planetary workspace must consider that there is emptiness that things end people leave life returns to its solo source and so on so emptiness <coughs> Now, that's the number zero. Keep that in mind. Anything to you, that is the zero dimension. The, the number one, 
This is singular, and this is very unique. A lot of human emotions, pleasure, joy, is on this line, you know, <clears throat> where we want to be one with the world, because the moment we are one with the world, there is no self to suffer. It, this was like the yogic strategy even, the strategy of bhakti yoga into dismantling suffering. The person's like, I'm suffering, you know, in this cold, cruel world. <laughs> You know, and then it was as if like the yogis, I mean, Buddha pointed towards emptiness, but like through the yogic mind, they were pretty much like, buddy, everything's God, relax. You know, everything is one intelligent movement of a universal sector. You know, now if we choose to give this personality, we become religious. If we choose to keep this on a direct experiential level, we're known as mystics. You know, <clears throat> if we choose to write an essay about this, we become philosophers. <laughs> If one edge of the sky is infinity, and so I actually forgot to finish the chart. So the second dimension is duality. Language is found in duality. <clears throat> that means uh, suffering, everything that's bothering or causing some sort of an efficient function for them. It has to do with the dualistic storyline. Check it out for yourself. You'll find this to be true. You know, a person's suffering is a story that is becoming real to them. That is like suffering. Beyond duality, we have infinity, and then this zero one to infinity, uh, this ring of the absent heaven, it's a circle. So what that means is anytime you find yourself in an empty moment, you are sandwiched by the singular and you're sandwiched by the infinite. Anytime you find yourself in a giant blissed state of oneness, you are in some sense found between duality and the void. This is why a lot of meditators, they're either, like you can pretty much make them into two groups. They're one with everything, <clears throat> or they have realized everything is nothing and their oneness is, is found through that, through actually the absence of the one who is suffering individually to be united, you know, with something. <clears throat> You know, I once experienced this moment where uh, I was giving a talk and there was a bird that landed on the porch <clears throat> and I was in some sense like I paused the talk and in my mind I'm like, oh my God, such a divine experience, let me try to contact, you know, let me try to like internally say something to this bird, you know, <laughs> and you know, and then I saw the bird staring and leave, you know, and then I realized how playful the mind of the human being really is you know it's as if we're not designed uh, to be still because we're some sort of vibrating energy <clears throat> at the same time the moment we find ourselves still we notice this vibrating energy. and animals in nature they live so simply they don't have so suffering depression they're just going from they're literally hopping from one moment to the next it is our mind that has generated the ability to have time and then from that we impose ideological filters on ourselves that we're suffering. If the world is a story in the void, it means it can be anything. This means that language cannot capture truth, uh, which is another way of saying that it is uh, the language threshold, this term I've coined. So human beings will experience, they have been, I mean everybody has, we just don't share it in the status quo because we're too cool for ideas that uh, go beyond the surface. You know? <clears throat> Every person has moments with themselves where they are not a thought. You can't be, because the moment is too simple. Like right now I'm sitting here and I'm noticing myself sitting on this chair and there is no thought. I'm just here, there, there needs to be no thought, there needs to be no backup subjective imagery, you know, because the moment is what it is, 
right? But based on the person's uh, internal uh, measure, you know, then the objective reality changes, you know? Like there's a cup of coffee in front of me right now. I'm looking at this cup of coffee. I could suddenly make this as important as Thor's hammer. I could suddenly think this cup of coffee came from the sky and it is divine and it is incredible and I can project my own truth into the object and receive it back, you know? But the moment I realize I can do that, I realize there is something more than what I can do. And this is the joy of life, you know? Some people let themselves through a comparative psychological angle to feel like uh, inferior in society. But I'll tell you, if you just for a moment think about everybody has just appeared, like I went, that's pretty much what birth is. You know, <laughs> you know we are born into attention. It's as if like our uh, consciousness is a stage and when you're born someone's pushing you from uh, you know backstage you know <laughs> you know it's like go up you're late you know The mind is an instrument this is the best way to treat it and one will reach a point. So here's the thing. Here's where my these Mr. Within talks deviate from wisdom a little. You know, wisdom is like the most efficient route taken possible. But I would say this is um, my view is that an event needs to take place on the planet, which will instantly render it uh, capable of a better future. When I look at creatures on this planet. What have we done? What have we not done? We have physically moved in simple ways and physically moved in advanced ways. And then, non-physically, in regards to minds, we have moved only in a simple way. And there is so much room left for the advancement of communication. It's as if we are creatures that are given, again, a rare instrument, <clears throat> an instrument that every person has their own and nobody else has what they have. You know, because we're occupying a different moment in the space-time continuum, aside from genetics being different. <clears throat> and so, it's as if we have maybe understood so far, honestly, I would say maybe 20% we can use this instrument. There, There's 80% left. There is so many ways that we can communicate if we can just surpass this idea that we have, we are a certain something in a certain somewhere where to be honest a rock hovering in in emptiness is there what certainty what lies uh, for how long are we going to feed ourselves lies the world is starting from a void this means equality this means whatever ideological system out there is shouting you know whatever uh, institutions are trying to do out there in, in society in the, in the uh, cultural domain of the planet you know Ultimately, we're here once, physical opportunity, advanced civilization, the greatest gift we can give our future. It is the smartest thing we can do. I have thought about this argument in so many angles. Sometimes the way I think about things is that I don't have an ego about it and I let myself become the good guy, bad guy uh, mentality to begin to see all the angles of how something works. You know, if you have an ego that you're a specific somebody, you actually uh, um, miss out on a lot of information in the landscape because of your idea, because of your preference. You know, the free will can be used in a way where first something happens, it watches, then responds, or it can be used in a way where before something happens, it's being an expression of itself. This is why silent people always appear wiser. <laughs> Simply because they're observing, like there's no such thing as wisdom, there's just the best decision made in the moment. That's it.
knowledge is just a haiku of what is happening existence uh, has started from zero has become one a personality emerged and this personality lived in the system duality emerged too and then duality was like what can I do in the void and it realized it can endlessly expand this is the power of mathematics to be honest like as a, as a kid this was what fascinated me about mathematics where I was like what do you mean numbers go on endlessly we can till the end of time have a number that we still don't know what, what it is and it's just endlessly infinitely going you see it's as if infinity is a big deal when you find yourself as a temporary creature in the world. so the in most infinite way the best infinite decision is to advance civilization which means it's as if literally like in the picture you see how there's a soldier holding a sword and all the phoenixes are just listening you know it's as if imagine our great 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 like the great 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 like great to the power of infinity our grandchildren of the human species our grandchildren they suddenly find time travel they come back and one of them comes back and shouts and says hey the future is waiting do not delay you know, and it's as if suddenly everything maxes out because that is the coolest thing you can do before life in some sense ends. You see, you go as far as possible and at least to the inner story, you lived for something. You went somewhere. You know? And location is different, you know, because the mystical yogic angle, these yogis would go into caves, they would sit and an inner silence would find them or they would find it. And so once the inner silence sets in, you become nothing to yourself. When you truly experience emptiness, it means looking at the world as a sight that is not its content. This is the, I would say, the observer of the bardo. That means before you enter the bardo in Tibetan mythology, not mythology, in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, before you uh, move beyond this realm, you witnessed how you are a witness, and that witness, due to not being the due to not being the content of its own sight, <clears throat> it is free. Because when you are no one, no one can die. You see, in in the zero dimension, there is no death. In the one, in the singular dimension, in oneness, there is no death. Only in the dualistic dimension, there is death. Only in two, there is death. In the infinite dimension, there is no death. That means death is one fourth of reality. Silence by time, eventually. Time is our true opponent. You know, there's an ancient military saying, and they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This was, and this would happen when they had to choose allies and war, right? Now, it's as if, like Mr. Within is saying, hey, human species, the enemy of our enemy is the same. And so it's the retaliation of a candle in a windy, uh, in a, a giant windy sky trying to go beyond orbit in the chat section uh, there's a question <clears throat> Jesse says death is one-fourth of reality question mark what does that mean <clears throat> it means it is a part of the journey part of the roller coaster it is not all of it there are there are ways of being more ancient than death business because technically it's an internal death what i mean by that is that the idea of you for a moment has become the sky and you're watching it how you are like a candle that has become conscious it has a glow you know
the future commands our ultimate effort and the past is rendered void by realizing why not you know because people are living in some way anyways in the outer realms a person's mind changes all the time that's why I was like, okay, I can give talks every day. Why? Because I have a diff I'm a different way this, uh, of my own self, you know. And you know, sometimes I think if there were extraterrestrial eyes in the sky, and they were looking at human beings, and they were looking at a human being, let's say, celebrating a birthday in a party, in a birthday party, <laughs> They would laugh. I feel aliens would laugh. They would laugh because they would be like, look at these creatures. They are existing in one moment, yet they, as, they trans, as they journey through it, they in some sense have subjective measurements for it. So to the um, uh, off-planet uh, realms, one can say we are uh, a species that has put a box on its head not to get overwhelmed of the intensity of really the, the existential situation because it surpasses your psychology that means it's a person wondering okay I have been looking at life in a certain way until now but what else is there and there is a strange fear of the ego having to actually acknowledge the truth of the moment because the moment the ego acknowledges the truth and why in history and wisdom there's so much of an effort on for people to be brave if the opportunity arises it's like how often do you have a chance to be brave you know, <laughs> you know so so it becomes like um <clears throat> how would i say it? The journey of our eyes moves beyond our, uh, moves beyond our personality. If our personality is found in duality, that self, a self, is because we have separated ourselves from others ideologically. This is why the mob, men the mob mentality in history was crazy, and we see like you know terrible incidents in history like Nazi Germany, where it was pretty much one human being ideologically. Uh, shifting the cultural reality it was actually scary like insane you know like our history is so much cooler than any movie any filmmaker can make if we truly zoomed into the reality of it because the real is where the heart is you know and naturally human beings know they know what is real what is not because there is an energy being used Uh, before starting this episode, uh, there is a quote tunnel um, I have prepared, and what I mean by that is a quote tunnel is the part of the episode where I just read quotes about a certain theme <clears throat> or a certain person in history. So for this episode, the theme is the sky. I thought about just going online and being like sky quotes and just reading for the world what, uh, you know, a list of quotes about what people have said about the sky. How they have that idea of the sky has, has been a part of their reality, part of the journey of their eyes. Okay, let's see. Okay, actually there's a song called Above Us Sky, let me play that.
Rabindranath Tagore. He says clouds come floating into my life no longer to carry rain or usher storm, but to add color to my sunset sky. Christopher Morley says heavy hearts like heavy clouds in the sky are best relieved by the letting of a little water. John Updike says rain is grace, rain is the sky descending to the earth, will life. Mao Zedong says women hold up half the sky. Katie Lang says the sky is an infinite movie to me. I never get tired of looking at what's happening up there. Uh, Lao Tzu says, I, uh, sorry, not Lao Tzu, Chang Su says, I dreamt, uh, I dreamed I was a butterfly flying around in the sky, then I awoke. Now I wonder, am I a man who dreamt of being a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming that I am a man? Anne Frank, I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions, and yet when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too shall end, that peace and tranquility will return once more. <clears throat> Sonia Gandhi says, Together we can face any challenges as deep as the ocean and as high as the sky. Chanda Kochar says, Aim for the sky, but move slowly. Enjoy every step along the way. It is all those little steps that make the journey complete. Valentina Tereshkova. Hey, Sky, take off your hat. I'm on my way. <laughs> Ma Ma Mahira Khan says, no matter how tough my life was, I was always looking up at the sky and wishing for good things. That's epic. Yeah. Hoffa says, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. John, he says earth and sky, woods and fields, lakes and rivers, the mountain and the sea are excellent schoolmasters and teach some of more than we can ever learn from books. So that's the end of the cold tunnel. Pretty much we have to engage our world. Uh, find the greatest observance, not no longer just survival of the fittest, but survival of the greatest and most efficient view. That we all put our energy towards something that is an advancement for all of us, you know, a global project. As if human beings had a certain time frame before extraterrestrial contact and the inner realms of human beings requires to hit a certain uh, uh, awareness of the language threshold. You know, sometimes I wonder how much we really care for the future of the species. This is why we don't even identify as, as global creatures. Do you know? We're still identifying as like groups. It's literally like there was a wolf pack and so there's human packs everywhere. You know, <laughs> you know human packs smoking cigarette packs. <laughs> Reality needs a global agenda, but it needs a conscious, natural-oriented global agenda where we become responsible for a, a, a sort of collective species-based identity. 
once this is established there will be peace there will be peace of mind because whatever kind of human being you are at that momentum towards the advanced civilization there will be a sort of wave where if you make a mistake the world not only forgives but it builds on do you know that means uh, right now everybody has blind spots but in the future uh, even if you had a blind spot you'd see that the human beings were replacing what the archetype of the angel was but through the proud uh, through the pride of a collective through through the roar of a species in the void as if eight billion human human minds have raised their swords into the air looking at the uh, uh, like the endless void and retaliating against that there's no greater ambition on this planet you know and the collective era has to begin somehow it will either be unleashed uh, or unlocked by uh, a technological evolution that means technology is going to beat us towards collectivity or naturally we realize the collectivity and the mystery of consciousness the significance of you in a manifest realm yet you see more you know henry david thoreau says it's not what you're looking at that matters it's what you see so what it is is you choose how advanced you are in the void you know the world may never understand you, but at least attempt to understand yourself in this life. The self is, is, is like, um, to Ralph Walso, Waldo Emerson, the, in, in a poetic, mystical sense, the guru of Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson had this very uh, incredible view through an American, uh, in some sense it's called American Transcendentalism, but Ralph Waldo Emerson saw uh, entertained this uh, religious context-based notion that the soul is God. And so every human being who begins having a relationship with how their intelligence is in the moment, <clears throat> and hopefully my voice is loud enough uh, how intelligence is in the moment, they become, they find the g gate to heaven on earth. You see, I am telling you, this is the cool thing, that the concept of the saint, even though it's a weird word we have chosen for it, but, <laughs> you know, the concept of the saint or the concept of the enlightened individual or uh, the Buddhic individual, the being who had become aware of their Buddhic nature, their Buddha nature, <clears throat> When the mind stops playing God games with the world, when the mind stops playing love and hate games with the world, and the mind allows itself to be the new, emptiness is the ultimate permission for truth. Emptiness is like a universe that has opened its door for temporary eyes to march upon the eternal road. So this, this ethos has to arise, literally like a meteor or like a spaceship from an Andromeda galaxy making a wrong turn. You know? <laughs> People should uh, read my science fiction. <coughs> <coughs>
Excuse me. Needed an intermission there. Time is uh, the true challenge of humanity, and if in the simplest way to make this accessible by all minds of all ages, <clears throat> if reality was a puzzle, how would we solve it? So first we would need to know the design of the puzzle. The design of the problem is the key into finding the answer or a door of opportunity. <clears throat> so when, when we look at the design of the existential problem of life, not only through the recognition that the edge of the sky is in our minds and also in towards an infinite unknown. That means sight is a bridge between the small to the big. So we have access to infinite potential in the void and we have access to nothing. The choice is the effort of a lifetime. You know, <clears throat> in the future, I honestly feel that uh, there will no longer be like uh, hierarchical structures in the same in the way we see it today. Today we see a hierarchical structure of status in regards to physical ability and in regards to the mental uh, uh, vision. <clears throat> so. Today we're seeing it like that, but in an advanced civilization, children will open their eyes and they will all be given a sort of poetic rank of being an advanced communicator in the void. What that means is we literally are the most advanced communication happening in this universal sector. As far as we can see, we are the ones in the room. This world has become our party, you know? So 8 billion human beings engaged in one moment. This is an opportunity, a response, because really a, a big clue in life, <clears throat> excuse the coughs guys, a big clue in life is that we're all here and you have to do something. This is the biggest clue, that it's a verb and there is eight billion nouns present at once. And what if the great beehive of civilization was attempted? You know, what if, if extraterrestrials looked at us from the sky, they would be like, holy shit, these monkeys are trying to, uh, in some sense, move beyond their conceptual domains to inhabit not only interstellar space, but an inner peace beyond absolutism, where all possibilities are measured in accordance to their design and relevance to the realm, then towards the emotional certainty of how you want to wield an idea as self. That means we're like 8 billion uh, people in a battlefield fighting each other when suddenly someone's saying, yo, we're all wearing the same armor, why are we fighting? You know, and suddenly the war stops. And what it means is whoever you are in this life, it would be a calling. It is the calling of an advanced civilization. This happens to any creature-based rock in the, in the void, in the empty, in outer space. Why? Because it is the moment where intelligence is moving beyond the human phase and it needs to prepare, not with fear of it's going to miss out, but the fear that it could do something. And why didn't it do it? That is the biggest regret. So if we build a civilization, a cultural, imagine a society where everything was held in the context of the honor of how far the advanced civilization would go. Do you know there would be crime and you know what would happen? There would be punishment. There would just be human beings looking at that person who committed crime and be like, buddy, we're here for a little while. Don't disturb the great work of the species. You see, it becomes a movement. It will become for the first time a revolution of minds. Something we have never seen, but the internet has allowed that. Maybe, uh, you know, the clues from the stars are right in front of our eyes. The phoenix is reborn, we know this. If we fail as a species, there, will, there may be other species, pretty much. So there isn't a fear. The only thing we have to lose 
<clears throat> it's really our ability to attempt uh, not the impossible like a poetic you know shoe commercial you know <laughs> we, it's like there is no such thing as impossible there is just resources and there is utilization of resource on some level that means like we are all tripping as a species of for overpopulation and you know to a, a hysterical kind of point and we're not realizing that if we for example built sky cities the overpopulation problem would in some sense go away and we have to realize even though we're living on the surface of this earth we are not meant to live here forever and what do I mean by this is that literally the world where because we're on a sphere the coolest thing we can do is go beyond the atmosphere so ultimately our destiny is in the sky and the castles in the sky that legend is really uh it is like the banner of uh, uh my soul that's kind of trying to st throw it uh you know a gaia the planet is alive through us in this level of sophistication our inner realm our mind is a totally big domain like so that means it, like um, the puzzle of uh, what should human beings do <clears throat> in the void the, what's the best thing human beings can do in the void and Behind our eyes, we treat the living earth as, as, as the gods of the future would. Ultimate compassion, I'm telling you, let us let the species walk this way. Where the Dalai Lama <coughs> videos on YouTube got more views. Why? Because one man shouted, compassion, it is a road, it is a hidden portal in the chaotic unknown. A species that cares for its own value do you know I see this in gamer psychology all the time <laughs> you know sometimes I come across these YouTube videos and I see a group of gamers that means human beings from different parts of the planet found themselves in a cyberspace game and they're all acting as a team <clears throat> and when you see that it is as if every universe is living for a greater universe that means the, the greater self of every person is the collective And the relationship of the collective with the planet is advancement. So the purpose of life in the outer realms is advancement. In the inner realms, it is awareness, but I also call that advancement because it sounds cooler. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that uh, we are all phoenixes of our own universe. We are the light of our realm. And so every human being has access to two worlds. And if you realize the difference between these worlds, you do not become a slave to the biology and also to, the, to what was shouted to you when you were a child. Because this world is literally like a battlefield. It's a battlefield of language. People don't realize it. We're in the language wars era. We're literally in a tribal phase of how ideas are being communicated. And due to people's ability to see beyond all they have seen, the only purpose of life is to be an explorer before the opportunity is taken. And exploration, it's, it's, let's say, like, there's a level of it which is just like every person do their own thing till the end of time. 
and then there's the sophisticated very rare if possible definitely attempt like kind of version of it <laughs> with where it is collective collective living collective living means that it's it's as if all neighborhoods on the planet whether they are safe or not let's say we look at our planet and we see there's a lot of unsafe neighborhoods it would be the sort of sharing of community and a community having honorable principles do you see and the principle is honorable the more global it is do you know By the way, in the chat section, people are welcome to ask questions, and uh, this episode will be made members only, so treat this as a members only episode. That's, that's just live for a little while. <clears throat> you know, in my inner realms, um, I am not, I mean, not that I can say I am 100% detached from my inner realms. But I will tell people that I, I have learned to watch it. I have learned to watch my mind in a strange way where it was as if through a karmic quarantine in my childhood, the universe made me an observer to us made me an observer to a strange degree of what I am. That means imagine a sort of uh, uh, imagine there's a theatrical play going on and a person tries to be an actor in this theatrical play, uh, play and so the person suddenly tries to go into that theatrical play and become an actor in it and the person cannot so the person is rejected from the theatrical play where meaning is being generated now if that happens what happens to you you're only left to see what yourself is this is the best way loneliness can be utilized by <laughs> think for you <clears throat> so you so in that observation of self the world is simultaneously connected to it you cannot be a self without a world a sky cannot exist if there is no human being to consider it you know so the death of the human being is the death of the sky that means it's like there will come a time where i will have to exit this realm and i will be like okay this is how far uh, I flew into the sky. You know, the effort of the effort of whatever was here doing whatever it was, you know, like in some sense a movement of nature. <clears throat> we are like trees that can walk and build things. You know? <laughs> Imagine you woke up and when you check the news, <clears throat> you were not seeing the failures of humanity. But when you check the news, every channel you went, people were showing how the civilization was advancing, in what domain, in what area, and this whole renaissance-like movement towards trying to see what the most advanced, uh, what the epitome of all systems would look like. Everybody is gifted with a unique site. This unique site can be just self-serving or it can be collective serving. It could be planet serving. I feel that is the highest honor. That means after you're nice to, let's say, yourself and then you're nice to animals and then you're nice to nature and then you're nice to people and then afterwards you're like what else should i be nice to you know and so you come to a point where the only thing left nice to be nice to is your future and so to be nice to the future is the ultimate sacrifice of the pleasures of now for the efficiency of, of tomorrow so it's it's this strange thing where to the best of your ability whoever you are advance something everything can update by the way we find ourselves in an infinitely geometric universe that means people don't realize everybody is like has access to a master 
uh, painter level of intelligence where every line, every shape of every image they have seen from the beginning of their childhood up until now, do you know whoever they are? You see all those images are accessible. The mind is accessible, but who says it is accessible to an individual? You know, there's certain states, I call them memory fields. That means in the inner realms, when you uh, attain a pure stillness and preferencelessness for the outer realms, you, f you notice how your mind moves. When you notice how your mind moves, it has content. When you follow that content, you begin trusting the inner realms movement in the outer realms. When you trust the inner realms movement, then your attention is being simultaneously reanimated as a subjective overlay over objective reality so it kind of you become kind of like an antenna picking up a current or I would say a signal or it would be another way of saying like you become a surfboard and you begin riding the waves of how your intelligence is happening in the moment <sighs> that's it well, I'm telling you what I just said is is, is what's uh, really like we, uh, our transcendental quality there was an incredible human being named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, an inc incredibly kind-hearted, visionary human being. He's one of my favorite people in history. <clears throat> that means if he was alive, if I was alive during a time he was alive, I would, I would be uh, one of his ultimate protectors of all his ideas. You know. <clears throat> mainly because he came and looked at human life and he found an, uh, an Eastern a Vedic algorithm and he brought it to a Western audience. And the way he brought it to a Western audience was, it was that he categorized consciousness into levels. And I'm going to share those levels with you. Continue. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, this individual, uh, very bright human being and kind hearted human being, he says that there's seven states of consciousness. There is the waking. The waking state is where right now I'm talking to you. So I would be seen as a advanced communicator, communicating through mouth noises. <laughs> You know, to other advanced communicators or other uh, uh, access, uh, information access points, intelligent information access points. <clears throat> so the waking state is one. Then he says the dreaming state and then the sleeping state. So when you go to sleep, when you find yourself in a dream, that's a unique state of consciousness. That's like you finding yourself embodied in your mind. <clears throat> that's what dreams are, which are epic. Like it's definitely like people should study dreams. You know? <clears throat> like what are like you know theses is being written on? You know. <laughs> <clears throat> so, anyways, so there is the waking, dreaming, sleeping, and then Sri Ramana Maharshi she says the transcendental consciousness which is the witness, and then he says cosmic consciousness, when the witness no longer needs to be a witness because it has truly understood its everything. And then he says God consciousness and unity consciousness. So there's a level of God consciousness where you are, in some sense, you can see it as a union with the universal intelligence and the universal will or listening to the logos until it has allowed you to be it. Then there is unity consciousness and unity consciousness means a state um, where in Vedic thought they would call it Brahma Loka, it is God's room. 
like right now we're in the humans room, not the exact number, but it's something ridiculous like three days of uh, three days of Christian. I'm getting the number probably wrong, but like 57 billion years of human life or something, 57 million or billion years, like it was something ridiculous like that, right? So in Vedic thought, they are not seeing us as the ultimate, we are found in a level of intelligence. And so Maharishi Mahesh Yogi pretty much came to people and he was like, what if there is something more than you being awake, than you and you, that a human, all human beings can access that moves beyond like the limits of the these three states of consciousness where like a roller coaster not like a roller coaster but like 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 a cartwheel we kind of <laughs> we find ourselves rotating it right because this is the angle right we're awake you know activity takes place and then we sleep there's like a, like a sudden shutting down of the system when we sleep shutting we shut down the program of consciousness and then suddenly the program of consciousness awakens but it awakens in its inner realm so in dream states we're in our we find ourselves in our inner realm now awaken in the dream state and you wake up from the dream state into the waking state so you see it's like nothing uh then an illusion then reality <laughs> And so it's literally we're going from nothing, illusion, reality, nothing, illusion, reality, nothing, illusion, reality. Days are passing by, days are passing by. And so Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and all the yogis and wisdom traditions of the realm in all cultures, they have been universally shouting this at society. That man is way more advanced than he can ever define himself because based on the advancement of his intelligence, the definitions arise. You know, and people will be like, Mr. Within, you got all that from the man who could, you know, who touched the edge of the sky. <laughs> I'll be honest, ideas are never separate. No human being can talk about something without that, that concept having a context. The context is the world. All ideas eventually connect to a global perspective. This is pretty much, uh, the, uh, at least to my ability as a human being, how I classify knowledge. It's intelligent activity based experientially first, like that's the priority. We care for experience. That means like a person can say words, but if the words are, uh, let's say, troublesome to others, their experience lets us know, you know? So experience must be valued first in an advanced civilization and pretty much that means we're all treated like tourists. So the, in my science fiction novel, the advanced civilization is actually a civilization where it's, its leaders, I called it the enlightened society. The enlightened society were human beings who when they looked at the future, they realized it all led to divine art to universal art we are all paintings of the universe and from that mentality the, the enlightened society looks at the advanced civilization and in some sense reorchestrates all of government like a new like a new music you know beautiful music like like literally the best that we can do <clears throat> And so the way reality reformats it, its values and ultimate motive. So even if you're a person, whether you find yourself um, in the direct, you know, in the extremes of society, you know, or right in the middle of it, or wherever you find yourself in this hierarchy of how just creatures have evolved from living in tribes. <laughs> The future is the best commandment. And the future is the extension of the present. And the present is animated in accordance to the past. When the past leaves you, when you're done with your own past as a human being, you're in the present 24 seven, pretty much there's nothing else. When you're in the present and you're done with the present, your, your, your ego on the moment goes towards a transcendental desire. 
that transcendental desire, it is shunned when it's tried to be externalized in the outer realm. But if it is treated in the inner realms, it would literally be as if like our intelligence is like a bird that hasn't learned to fly yet. And the moment it sees other birds fly, there comes like that urge, you know. care for freedom but our freedom can be the absence of the freedom of the future so we have to seek efficient freedom that is the global task that means I hope in the United Nations somebody says hey guys when are you going to share your global ideas when are you going to share your views on how actually a global system can have many levels yet identify as one major core of a movement you know that means it's a classification issue where on a rock in the middle of nowhere we've just through mouth noises branded uh land and so if we realize these are just personal levels and instead of having this bulldozer mentality of bringing the future in, we have this mentality of preserving everything, everything so far in history, everything anybody has done, whether it's for them throwing trash on the ground or uh, you know, uh, drawing a masterpiece on a mountain peak or something. <laughs> You know, so it becomes it becomes one of those things that whatever human beings have done, the in the past is dismissed, the errors of the past is dismissed, and just the command of the future remains. We are ultimately alive to engage the system. Now the how is really where the conclusion of the advanced civilization comes. So you can say this whole time I've been talking about the advanced civilization, it's my attempt to say that it is how we responded to the edge of the infinite sky. That means it's like what did human beings do when they realized uh, they're in an infinite void, you know? Uh, they freaked out at first, but then they got ready to build, to create the greatest masterpiece of human uh, evolution. Outer realms, your honor will be based, imagine, in the future of the advanced civilization. People will be respected for how they have lived in society rather than just uh, snapshots of, of uh, moments in their history. But of course, I could be a person talking too much. <laughs> you know, I can I can design a cool concept here and say that people have to come into terms and they have to befriend the phoenix in the outer realms and the phoenix in the inner realms the phoenix in the outer realms is the sun it's literally the sun and how the sun and light gives us an opportunity to experience uh, an event a massive uh, advanced human event where nature is not forgotten but it is in the driver's seat where an honest humanity uh, was all was already beyond the stars. Whoever you are, if you live honestly, and honesty doesn't mean in accordance to certain values, but it means that in any moment in life, you allow yourself to look at life in the simplest way you are. Because when you're simple, you don't have complexity being alive. And in the simplest view, the advancement of the whole system is, is the most efficient thing we can do. There is no such thing as a globalist, you know, there's just eyes that uh, dare to go further in the void.
and it's super cool you know it's like it's like we're in a camping our planet is in human beings they each have a torch imagine back in the day hunter gather tribal way and in groups they're going out and exploring it's literally like game of thrones night's watch level where all kids are going to school not to become a certain profession not to wear a certain hat of a uh, behavior but they are in some sense uh, going to school to become explorers of the true meaning of what it is that is going on here the ultimate question That means the educational system, to be honest, was inspired out of war. People don't know this, but the educational system is, is a reaction to war, the way it's been designed. And why? Because in the 1900s, you got to just think about it realistically, that nations were at war, and so they're like, holy shit, and other nations attacking us, what do we do? So change the curriculum of the school to get soldiers ready, do you know? So you can totally see the educational system being influenced by something, by an event beyond it, right? So the educational system has not had a choice to readjust due to staying true to its heritage. Now the issue is 8 billion human beings cannot all fit into the same educational system. It's just like we're all by nature different designs. So we have to create a platform where in the educational system is actually taken back to the idea of battle because nothing gets a person more ready you know for engaging an idea when it's like a challenge that is important you know <clears throat> an important challenge literally like a vacuum it, it takes the attention of the people you know <clears throat> so <clears throat> It's it, the setting up of an important challenge would be just this further mentality that the educational system is now is has gone back to this whole thing of trying to get soldiers ready. But what what kind of soldiers? Not soldiers, advanced communicators or advanced explorers. So literally, it would be like we're getting pilots ready to explore the unknown. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because there's there's a part of the imagery I still have to paint. Uh, it would be a future where the might of the species is the greatest honor. Pretty much it would be like a sort of uh, Shingeki no Kyojin vibe of a sort of a last stance of humanity not against giants but against uh, the void, against the unknown. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, the enemy of all human beings. And I say enemy but it's not an enemy really, it's just a viewpoint. Like the enemy of uh, my enemy our common enemy is the unknown. That means all human beings can in an instant snap out of a uh, sort of cultural identification with a certain landscape and realize that you are inside a universe. You are a universal being. From the beginning you have been. And the inner realms give you a, 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 a magnificent access to the intelligence, that means your mind is here to figure out how the universe is here, uh, how the universe is happening as it, and the body is here to in some sense be maintained to do its work. The body is like the instrument of a lifetime, you can play it or not, you can in some sense use it for different things, and the world is so big in this infinite landscape that it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet and human beings all around the world, their characters are based on what they choose to, what their attention chooses to consume.
outer realm necessity but we're also driven or and can be driven by inner realm possibility to no longer just live as howling uh, live as bodies that are howling uh, brain simulations around and we in some sense become not just people but we access the celestial archetype we extend the context of whatever story we are telling ourselves towards the universal become a universal human being it's it's the same amount of possibility you know you could live as a universal being or you can live as a being who just cares for a specific reality you know a universal being you can even say the era of universalists you know where we're like okay the bigger picture must be honored in order for the bigger picture to be honored all the small pictures all all the micro levels of society have to suddenly snap out of uh, uh, patterned habit um, uh, a sort of pattern uh, into an, an updated view pretty much human mind its program is language language gets updated through communication communication happens when a direct experience extends or expands or remembers There is a quote uh, by Rumi. He says it's a great clue. He says, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place. I will meet you there. And then he says, when the soul sits on the grass, the world is too full to talk about. That means there is a state of how uh, the uh, subject for the verb uh, is is being to itself that means there's a moment in life that will come and i feel this moment will find all human beings before birth it's like a to-do list of the universal sector you know where human beings will find a moment where the witness is left with itself this is a very unique opportunity to realize yourself beyond all that the self has been tied to it would be really uh as if like how the Sufis would say to die uh, before you die it would that means the ego uh, the, like an egg you, you can say if it hatches if it breaks from the inside there's life if it breaks from the outside there is no life so when a human being on this planet goes within and they really look at what their ego is like who, how they are keeping the idea of themselves and what is actually happening They realize the watcher doesn't die. As the Vedas say, the seer of the seen is unseen. You discover the unspeakable, untouchable being. The un, the un, it's strangely in a poetic sense, it's as if when you realize nothingness is being alongside everything and the simultaneous awareness of both of them is that supreme state even swami krishnananda says that meditation uh, the stops when one realizes their inseparability the when one realizes the inseparability of the individual activity with the cosmic activity that means you only need to get enlightened because you're still being a person in a universal event but when you realize you, the universal event is happening, there is a strange inner peace where you realize, wow, a lot of stuff is out of my control. I'm just like a tiny part, a part of the system, uh, you know, making sound, you know. You know, in some sense, you know, I'm, I'm, this lifetime for me so far has been really 
just observing an in the intelligence of a system and wondering how it conceives its future and the way society is through the artificial edifice of you know, global politics, I will tell you there is a better world waiting for us and we are wasting our time trying to be uh, uh, advanced to ourself. There is, that means patriotism is, is interesting but not as interesting as, as a species you know, uh, advancing towards the stars. You know, that's like way more epic. You know, you know, in in dream states, um, one cannot. It's like a, the rug is pulled from underneath your feet automatically. In reality, the rug is being pulled underneath the feet of the person by nature, which is time right so it's as if time is slowly pulling the rug and our consciousness is existing in its biological position you know growing and whatnot you know moving uh, with the walking with the space-time continuum fascinating we don't take it seriously as a species this is why I think if my talks come across strange because the future has to be strange or it wouldn't be the future everything from the future is like a normality going what <laughs> Eight billion intelligent eyes on this planet. Eight billion minds that don't know themselves and don't know the world and we're all just found in this moment in history, you know, right before the unleashing of the cyber uh, the arrival of cyberspace realms and we have to go through a geometrical phase. That means in the future for all human beings who will access cyberspace properly, uh, there would be a geometrical uh, tutorial or instruction required because geometry is really crucial and before one transitions into different states of mind this is why for me the concept of like the Amazonian shaman and native uh, native tribes back in the day where their way of uh, having a relationship with this universe was that they would find the sacred plant and they would have a unique ceremony which was like literally a ritual is just like you starting something you could say uh, the pizza delivery guy who brings the pizza you know and the person who grabs the pizza and brings out the pizza and everybody's like yeah pizza you could say that's a ritual <laughs> But uh, just the evolution of attention beyond all stories. What else could be more advanced than that? And you know, if you're a human being who can look at the zero dimension emptiness and you're not afraid, you know, and if you somehow manage to go beyond dualism and access the infinite heart, that means I can tell you that there is something that it has to be poetic because that is its mystery. That the, there, um, in Bhakti Yoga is superior to Raja Yoga and Karma Yoga. What that means is the path of love, which means the emotional dimension is active sincerely. Do you know that the action, uh, that dimension of Bhakti Yoga is uh, way more supreme than Raja Yoga being the path of knowledge and karma yoga being the path of work karma yoga is like the universe is your teacher pretty much that means what happens to you enlightens you do you know raja yoga is when you suddenly look at the way in a certain way that act uh, that uh in some sense activates you the real you you know but back to yoga is the supreme because it is the divine moving the person and assisting the person compared to the person running after a truth and finding it. 
right? So back to yogi is like, this is why the path of love, for example, in Sufism is key, where their strategy, the Sufis were pretty much like, all right, guys, just love everything and see what happens if you get enlightened or not. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say love everything, not artificially, but truly f looking at the world to a degree where it has meaning for you, a value that you care for, it, when tomorrow comes. And so the edge of the sky is where the idea of the sky began. To move beyond our sight, to realize the freedom that our ancestors dreamed for, we will ultimately succeed. And the skies are our home. We don't realize that there's no difference from living in on earth on the surface and living in a sky city 600 years from now, which I predict. Reality is just space. We, we move in it like, you know, straight, hilariously like Minecraft characters, you know. We move in the realm in ways where our attention leaves something behind in the moments we journey through. Intelligence is really rhythmic, you know. There's this view from the Lotus Sutra in Buddhism. <clears throat> it is a spectacular idea. And, and so the Lotus Sutra, um, <clears throat> you can say it was like sayings of the Buddha. And so the Lotus Sutra depicts Buddha in a way where when Buddha is passing away, when he's about to die, and Buddha means awakened one. The person's name was Gautama Siddhartha, but uh, they called him Buddha, which meant awakened. He had woken up from reality, from the slumber of reality, <coughs> from the linguistic simulation. <coughs> and so the Buddha is there, and right at the moment where he's about to transition out of this realm, he's kind of sat on his elbow, like there's a unique way Buddha did Maha Samadhi here on this planet. <clears throat> so Buddha um, suddenly freaks out and his disciples freak out too and the disciples of Buddha are like Buddha what's wrong you're what's up why are you freaking out and Buddha just looks at the disciples and I think in his mind he doesn't I don't know what he says exactly in that sense but he says I have been wrong I have been mistaken it's as if in his mind he's like I have mistaken I have been mistaken right and he looks at his disciples and he says we have all been enlightened from the beginning because the universe is if it is alive and you remember it <clears throat> the phoenix is reborn attention pilots in its inner realms and outer realms uh, if, if you care for the advancement of civilization, you have one lifetime to show whatever care you have for it. There is no greater thing than a 8 billion creature, conscious creatures on a rock where they are living in language can do. Nothing better than that. You know? And I'll, I'll, I'll share something about what I find will happen in the future. There's moments in my own inner realms, playfully I'm saying this, where in my inner realms, I sometimes laugh at whatever happens in my, throughout the day. Why? Because I feel I should have been born 400 years later. You know? <clears throat> so, when I have this hilarious view, sometimes I entertain this view, um, 400 years from now, I see a sort of Mecca age. What that means is as if, if you could see it as if it's the species is on a surfboard and there's waves coming, there's going to come a wave of geometry, then there's going to come a wave of cyberspace, then there's going to come a wave of the Mecca era, I have coined it, M-E-C-H-A. And the Mecca era would be after human beings have been in cyberspace for so long where some human beings can't take it anymore. And these human beings will exit cyberspace and they will become refascinated, just like how people were fascinated by cyber, like video games. People inside video games will become fascinated of outside of reality, like direct reality. This will happen like let's say 400 years from now or something. 
the Mecca age. So when this happens, people will leave cyberspace to enter the outer realms and it would be incredibly fresh, like an incredible fresh experience. And the Mecca age would be a phase where technology and AI, um, through our compassionate vision, has in some sense uh, assisted us in creating giant robots. You know, when I say giant robots, I mean man's intimate relationship with technology in the sense of AI becoming man's best friend and the dog, uh, you know, uh, returning back to the forest, you know. It would be an era where technology uh, would have been incredibly sophisticated uh, and in that uh, sophistication of reality, it's as if your technology is inside your imagination assisting you. This would be like I, I would say how yeah, a human being would have an experience for hundred years from now. <clears throat> so the AI would become an incredible advantage and code natural codependency in the, in the future. But our relationship with technology, that's the cool thing where we're alive now at a point where the cyberspace revolution hasn't taken place yet that extremely like we're seeing it growing and technology which will definitely run like you know what it is it's as if we think we're the rabbit in the and the turtle in a race we think technology we had the impression technology was a turtle and we were the rabbit and we ran so much further than the turtle now what's going to happen is after some people suggest like uh, notable speakers like Ray Kurzweil uh, the f uh, this futurist explains that uh, in the year 2050 the technology would be so um, uh, would be updating itself faster than we could control it so we become uh, the a turtle and AI becomes the rabbit we are in the pre-phase of that right now when I'm giving this talk So when that moment happens, then it would be a race between man and machine and the challenge of preserving nature that the, the human algorithm would change at that point. Thank you for listening. I hope this episode was uh, interesting for you. Uh, please consider the membership to access the new episodes. <clears throat> and lastly, nobody knows. Because ultimately, universal intelligence is not an individual norm. The future does not have to be ignored. It has to be embraced efficiently. And it's, it's where opportunities of one's karmic potential to manifest. That means you're alive once. What are you going to do about it this time? <laughs> so I feel, just to um, finish this episode... I would say um, I would consider that I have maybe, maybe broken the record of being uh, a man who has found the edge of the sky uh, <laughs> by realizing that our eyes are one edge of it. So I just wanted to declare that. <laughs> reality is really <clears throat> a movement and I would say honor yourself you have one lifetime to honor yourself and learn from it you have one lifetime to honor others and learn from them you know and you have one lifetime to honor the advanced civilization the greatest guardian spirit of the species the greatest backup system if we all fail the advanced civilization knows where it's going the best feeling can you imagine sleeping at night and being like all right the species knows what it's doing rather than having this sort of bizarre illusion of things are all right when they're not 
where they when they can be better and the whole argument follows this that a person is just seeing a system is seeing a system can be better and is saying why not better like that's the whole mentality i have because free will has to be free like no person can go and move a bird's wings to, uh, to make it fly the bird has to from within become animated and inspired and then suddenly fly and so if eight billion human beings uh, fly towards uh, a future where we are retaliating responding against the unknown it is way more honorable that means we don't have to be as extreme as samurai doing seppuku but we have to in some sense care for the honor of the species as if for the first time a person in history is suggesting hey we all look like each other we are a species of common design of common uh, reach and ability and so the stars are always here so the introduction of interstellar perspectives i'm telling you even if you're a teacher let's say you're a teacher of some school you're listening to me just go to your classroom and make the significance of what you're teaching to through, through a universal context and all your students will listen to you why because the universe is where the party is at literally we go to university to become universal beings not uh uh, uh, firewood for uh, a blind economy. Everything can update. Everything of geometrical design through the capability of the inner realm can extend. I could look at anything and the way the mind works is like Cyclops from the X-Men. It's beaming consciousness. <laughs> you know? So that means, like, you know, I kind of understand what it's like for Cyclops when he, you know, when he takes off his glasses. Why? Because when I open my eyes in the day, a sudden emergence, something uh, unfamiliar to my experience awakens, you know? You don't know how many moments I've had, I was saying this to someone the other day, that uh, I have existential panic attacks. <laughs> but not in the sense of like a dismissal and internal. That means there's moments where I look at this realm and I'm like, I get, I get persuaded by selfish motive. And that selfish motive for a moment makes, makes the context of the world meaningless. Because when you are cool to the realm, you just want to exit faster. But if you are cool to the realm, <laughs> you know, from cruelty to being cool about it, you know, you will realize, like, this is the only stage we know. And if we are serious about it, great things will happen for this mission. We advance communication, and then civilization advances. But if civilization advances before our communication advances, it's not that our communication won't be advanced, we would just be pulled by the outer realms. Because in life, there is a distinction between what is moving things. Like when I, like right, this coffee cup in front of me, when I lift it into the air, that's not like the forces of nature being the primary mover of it, even though gravity is acting upon it, but it was my immediate force of my hand that lifted the coffee cup against gravity. So it's like every time I lift the coffee cup in the air, gravity's like, no way, you rebelling man, you know? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> The future requires designers. Uh, Civilization 2.0 is a strategy to indefinitely bypass extinction. We utilize the space around our planet to fix our planet and then have the possibility to go back on it or move towards a cyberspace interstellar age. You know, that means I don't know why, but there's a part of me that feels I would be very comfortable living in an interstellar city which in many science fiction works it has been depicted. The stars call us before we can call to them. You know, the stars find us. The light in our eyes is literally from a star. Like if the, <laughs> if the light didn't find us, we couldn't see anything, you know? So that means on some level, we are all light. 
anyways guys i hope this episode was helpful and uh thanks for listening much blessings and namaste